and they do good, but everybody yeah. laughs at us still, don't they? Yeah. But- Hello and welcome. This is episode 10 of the Paul Ryder Tapes. I'm Angela Smith, the ex-wife of Paul Ryder, who sadly passed away in July of 2022. In the months leading up to his death, he sat down with me and told his entire life story, the highs and the crashing lows, and he opened up about some very personal things for the very first time. Coming up in this episode... We got a choice, they said to us, Manchester, Amsterdam or Barbados. So Manchester was out, never got anything done. Amsterdam, can you imagine? Uh, still be there, wouldn't we? He'd gone, the guy from London Records had gone and said, if you can't turn up for three million pounds, <laughs> I don't want to sign them. When you split up with your band, it is, there's nothing quite like, like, i say it's even worse than splitting up with your missus, you know what I mean? It's that. It's that heartbreak and heart wrench. Paul said, oh, I can't wait for this afternoon. I said, why? And he goes, uh, oh, it's that one where we find out whether the bass can make you shit if it goes, like, dead low. <laughs> I was sat in a chair rocking backwards and forwards because of this drug called Stelazine that they gave me, a psychotropic thing. And it just made me rock in the chair. And I remember thinking, OK, this is me for the rest of my life. I'm just going to be sat in a chair rocking backwards and forwards. And your addiction was still underpinning everything at this point, I'm guessing. Yeah, I still, I was still thinking nobody knew, but everybody knew. Yeah. At that point. But you were able to manage your life still. Yeah, yeah. And by that time, um, after the uh, after the Barbados thing and Sean went in rehab, by the time we was doing the tour, he was back with his habit. So he was like, uh, he, was, he wasn't on top form. But the shows were great. We all, we yeah. all pulled together for the shows on that tour. Where was your personal life at this point? Because you, you'd, your marriage had already broken up. Marriage had broken up. I was back, at, back with the parents, back mm. in my old bedroom. Wow, that must have been a bit heavy for you. Oh, yeah. I remember lying there one night thinking, what the hell's just happened? And, of course, you still had your heroin habit at that time, didn't you? I think maybe, and this could, this is just my opinion, you could see the demise of his dream ending and the band, and he'd lost control, and also that he could... We all knew it was ending, but obviously he, he took it a lot worse than all. We all took it quite bad, but he took it... I always thought it was an excuse. I could be wrong, you know, I, I, you know. And, it, yeah, it was really, really sort of disappointing because I knew as well, not only was it my best mate, I was losing, but also that air. Uh, from a selfish point of view, I knew that was definitely the end of the band. Do you know what I mean? If Paul wasn't functioning, you know, it wasn't happening. Yeah. And he knew that I knew that he knew that I knew that I knew that he knew, you know. So after you got back from Barbados and you did the tour for Yes Please, mm-hmm. there was then, Factory went, then went under. Factory went under. Phil Sachs had been doing A&R for Factory after he stopped managing the Mondays, so he'd been overseeing the recording of Yes Please for Factory from Manchester. The whole Barbados thing, I always remember that, because I was the A&R guy, I used to phone up weekly for a report of what was going on, and they had laid down all the tracks, and then, um, whatever, it was Simon, the sound man, I chatted to him, and they said, well, what about the vocals? He said, oh, we're setting up the table and chairs now for Sean. So I put the phone down. I'm thinking about it all day. One day we'd gone in the, in the studio and outside the studio was a swimming pool on a high, higher level. Bez was already in the hospital because he'd, he'd turned the jeep over and smashed his arm in. And I went, someone said, come have a look at this. And we went outside to the swimming pool and they'd made a crack den out of the sun lounges. Like a proper crap again. <laughs> just smoke coming out of the sun lounges. And the distance was this jeep turned upside down that Bez had left and the, the rental company couldn't go and get it because it was in the middle of the jungle, you know. But I, I had fond memories of it. I had fond memories of it. 
But I kind of resigned myself to the fact that it was over. I was thinking, table and chairs. Why do you need a table and chairs to do vocals? Because Sean's the only one who don't like that album. We kind of got pushed to go and do that album, even though we'd only half written it, because I don't think New Order had done an album for a while. So they relied on New Order and us for a little bit of funding because they'd signed all these bands. So we were pushed into it. When we actually split up, Factory owed us money. When the factory went bankrupt, they owed us, they owed us money. So, it, no, it was quite the opposite. And it did, that album didn't cost a lot to do. People think it was Barbados, it cost a lot of money. It didn't. It, the studio was cheap and the flights were cheap. Yeah. It was like, it wasn't that. Because we got a choice, they said to us, Manchester, Amsterdam, or Barbados. So Manchester was out, we never got anything done. Amsterdam, can you imagine? Uh, still been there, wouldn't we? And then I went to Tony and said, You can't fucking stand up, Tony. That's why they've got a table and chairs. And it was me who pulled the plug on that Barbados recording and brought them back. So it was because you got the call saying that they were setting up tables and chairs? For yeah, and I thought about it all day. Like I worked out that he couldn't stand up. Weird, isn't it? I think Tony thought, yes, please, would sell twice as much as Pills and Thrills, and it didn't. I remember they had always had a constant rise, you know, new order, new order. And I think they weren't ready for troughs and, you know, high hills and troughs sort of thing. Factory went under, owing us, the Mondays, £800,000. For what? For That's what they owed us, for money off the record. Oh, right, you never got that. We never got it. On the day the bailiffs went into Factory Records, Nathan was going down to Factory Records to get a cheque for £800,000, which is what they owed us in royalties. Wow. And... and um, that's what they hold the Mondays. And, uh, but the bailiffs got there before him. I didn't know this. Yeah. Well, there was a table, wasn't there? An infamous table that Tony had bought. Yeah. How yeah. much was that? 11 grand. <laughs> oh, it's not too bad, I suppose. <laughs> Hanging up from the ceiling with, um, I think it was wire from a sailing boat, some kind of yeah. strong wire. Oh, so it didn't have legs? No legs, it was just hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> about Tony? Tony was great man. I was always intimidated by him as well actually because I knew he went to the uh, clever school yeah. in Salford and he could speak Latin yeah. and it was like wow he must be really intelligent if he can speak Latin <laughs> so I was always a bit intimidated by him but he was always so down to earth always so down to earth and really just I can't thank him enough for letting us express our art you know, he'd let us do anything, yeah. anything we wanted to do. It was like, yeah, go ahead. This is great. It's like really? art. He was a visionary, wasn't he? he yeah, was a visionary. I was just starstruck, just like you'd been, you'd been, you know, boardwalk and uh, seeing him on telly. And what really impressed me turns up and rolls a spliff. <laughs> We'd all run out of our drugs, and he turns up and starts skinning up. Brilliant. Yeah, go on, Tony. And then he would, because he, he talks in a different sort of um, his. Different background, he's educated, went to Cambridge Uni, whatever. Tragedy and glamour are attractive to all of us, so it doesn't really help us understand the attraction of the iconic diva to the all my gay men friends. I think if you try to take Proust's theory that... And he was talking else, and you'd just be like, whoa. Fame of that sort, which is to quote that phrase, larger than life again. Fame of that sort is a roller coaster which whizzes you through real life. You just sit there and listen to what's coming in, it was great. And you don't, you don't live a real life. You live in this imagined bubble and it starves you of some of the sort of central ordinary nutrients of day-to-day -day life. Oh, he's a lovely man, brilliant character. Um, you, you just sit and listen to him. Um, and he loved us. If it wasn't for Tony, we wouldn't be anyway. He believed in us, which was, you know, nice. Yeah, fond memories of Tony. When ec Ecstasy came around, came along, it was like the final piece in the jigsaw. Tony Wilson sent me champagne, and my dad was a beer drinker. My dad had never had champagne, and by that time, my dad was dying. Yeah. And uh, he said... I said, go on, Dad, you've got to celebrate the lads. And he said, oh, 
oh, I quite like that. Can I have another? <laughs> and I also think that is the moment when Tony Wilson really understood them. He was always in the club, wasn't he? Yeah. You know, he oh, was a major... Yeah, but my dad worked on the news. My dad worked on the newspapers. Yeah. They did. They had a break every hour, yes, yes. and they were at work. They were in the Vincent. Is it the Vincent in town? And, and that was like the land of cakes. I know where you All been. the old pubs yeah. up near the Daily Express. They all went in. The yeah. Green Door. Yeah. They did, yeah. 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 They, oh, they were all. Mm. They were all mm. heavy drinkers. Yes, they were. Derek had never really been a drinker. Tony was always talking about. Uh, creating a revolution. He, wa he wanted to create something like punk. His big hero was Malcolm McLaren. He, wanted, he knew that music could be the vehicle to kind of knock the world off its axis. And I think he, he, he kind of, and the Mondays were that for him. And so the drug was part of, because Wilson was a grown up in the six, end of the 60s, when he was a student, he knew how important that new drug was to crystallising the new moment. We bought a bottle of Cinsano and lemonade for when his mother and dad came and they weren't drinkers, but they had a Cinsano and lemonade, lemonade on, box, yeah. on Boxing Day. Yeah. My mother used to say to me, my mother used to say to me, oh girl, oh girl, I do wish you'd shape yourself. Get yourself some big eye heels and get some jewellery on it and, and have, a good drink. have a good drink. He helped create the Manchester that is Manchester City Centre right now. Him and yeah. Tom Bloxham, who was a yeah. property developer. Yeah. You know, Tony had been over in New York and seen all these loft apartments in old buildings. Right. And he was like, we should do this to Manchester. Have City Centre living. Because yeah. back in them days, Manchester was yeah. desolate after six o'clock. Yeah. Scary place to be. Yeah. And he had this vision of turning all these old Victorian factories into apartments. And that's what it is now. Yeah. I remember sharing an office building with him, Chris Joyce, who yeah. was the drummer from Simply Red. Simply Red. He yeah. owned a building. Yeah. And Factory Two, I think it was. That's right, yeah. Was on the second floor of the building mm -hmm. and we were on the ground floor to turn on TV mm -hmm. and I was star whenever I bumped into him in the stairwell I was always really starstruck mm. weird isn't it he never called my mum Linda it was always Mrs Ryder really yeah and she'd always say call me Linda and he'd say no no it's respect respect darling yeah. respect Mrs Ryder yeah. yeah I used to go crimson if anybody spoke to me did you really very shy and quiet. Oh. I wasn't as a child. No. I never shut up. My well, mother's I brothers used to that. say, well, paint mustard on your tongue if you don't shut up. After Factory had gone under, mm. they then tried to broker a deal for you with London Records, is that right? Yeah, London Records bought the back catalogue from Factory at uh, a knockdown price, but they never got New Order. Because right. New Order was never officially signed with Factory. Were you officially signed? With yeah, we signed a deal. Okay. We signed a deal. I remember seeing that contract and Nathan had put some funny things in, like... Oh, yeah, a year's subscription to Viz yeah, and things like that. Yeah, and you had to have polo mints or something. Or yeah. Some kind of... You can always yeah. put silly things in contracts. Yeah. Um... So there was a big meeting, very infamous meeting that's been taught. It's the stuff of urban legend. Mm -hmm. this. Tell us the real story of that infamous meeting. The real story is we'd written five new songs and uh, the head of London Records came up to Manchester to our rehearsal room in Ancoats and we were supposed to play in these five songs live with Sean singing live. Great songs, still got a cassette of them, never got released. And, still got uh, that cassette? Yeah. Ooh. Mm. We I'll have to it. dig it out, it was at my mum's in the loft. It was a lifeline, and we were re rehearsing in Ancoats, and um, Sean hadn't turned up. Then eventually Sean did turn up, had a word, um, whatever they said, I don't know, but the next thing he said, I'm off for a Kentucky, and that was the end of it. So he came up from London with his offer of £3 million for five albums. 
and uh, we're all sat there waiting for Sean and it's and so he's just going for something to eat getting a Kentucky Fried Chicken and it just happened to be one of those days when every heroin dealer in Manchester had the phone switched off and he couldn't perform without it so it took him like six hours to eventually score and by the time he got back to the rehearsal room he'd gone, the guy from London Records had gone and said, if you can't turn up for three million pounds, <laughs> I don't want to sign him. So he completely blew it for a Sean's self-destruct button that I was talking about earlier. And the next thing, it was like me and Paul said, right, so no. grabbed our equipment because we know we're not going to see that again. <laughs> How did you feel that day? Absolutely fucking gutted. Yeah. Absolutely gutted. I was drinking more. Smoking weed, I had, my, I had my moments. You know, Mark was, so you, you know, we can't blame just heroin. Everyone had gone off on their own thing, but people weren't getting on. I think, yeah, the fame thing, the, the press were turning us against each other a lot. There was things where they were saying like, they'd say, are, are you resentful because you're, you're not on the cover of the, the magazine? So we were like, well, we know we're fine. They'd say to Sean, oh, the rest of the band, PD, they did it a lot with really. PD wanted to be on the cover and he didn't, you know. Well, maybe he did, I don't know, he didn't. But they kind of put us as though we were, we were bitter and like... Uh, and I think Sean saw that as us having an ego. And none of it was true, you know, from both sides. And we were a bit naive to us, to, uh, us and Sean. I think both of us were a bit naive. And you get people in your ear, you know, all people around us. Everyone was off doing their own thing a lot of the time. And we weren't spending time together as much like we used to. We were, we were a gang, we were, you know... A four or five headed monster, and that and, and that kind of changed. I think there's that kind of northern working class insecurity of thinking, you know, imposter syndrome. We're not good enough for this, so it's going to so it's going to end any moment. So let's not put too much heart and soul into it because it's all going to collapse at some point. So I think we all kind of accepted it. I mean, at the end when we when we split up, Sean said we should have just taken a break for six months or a year out, and that's probably what we should have done. But the, the but the problems were more deep rooted, I think. That's when Gaz, Mark and PD fanned out on me and Sean. They said, they called a meeting with Nathan in Nathan's office and said, we don't want to carry on anymore. You've just blown it. You just blew it. Did you know about that meeting at the time? Yeah, yeah. We, me and Sean turned up to the meeting and they said, we, oh. do, we, we don't want to do it anymore. He knew that it was over. And... Uh, yeah, it was a really sad time. Like I say, where when you split up with your band, it is there's nothing quite like. Like I say, it's even worse than splitting up with your missus. You know what I mean? It's that, it's that heartbreaking, heart wrenching. You know what I mean? It's like no feeling. I can't describe it. No, the nearest could describe it's like splitting up with your missus after ten years and you find her cheating. It's that sort of feeling. You know what I mean? And that's how awful it actually feels. No, when, 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 when you come to that moment. I was very angry. Yeah. Was you? I'm very, I was very angry. angry. Very angry. I thought, what an idiot. Yes. You know, what an yeah. idiot yeah. throwing all this yeah. away. Yeah. You see, I, I was upset because of Derek. I thought Derek had sold his soul for that band. That's what hurt me. That really hurt me. So I don't know how you must have felt, obviously. Well, you've got five minutes to kick off. Oh! You know, I should have kicked enough in a minute. And that was because of the heroin addiction of the two of you? Yeah, and mainly that he'd just blown a three million pound deal. Right. So, uh, you know, to give credit to our kid, he said to them, let's not split up, let's just have 12 months off, to go and do your own thing, and, and they wouldn't have it. And like a week later, Sean said to me, when are you going to phone them all and get them back together? Because that was my job, Monday had. Mm. You know, when he'd upset people before, it was my job to get on the phone and say, come on, it's fine, everything's going to be good again. And I said, I can't do it. I'm exhausted. And that's when the nervous breakdown happened. Talk me through that. Oh, wow. <laughs> what did that feel like? I ended up in a place called Meadowbrook, which is part of Salford Royal. 
It's not Salford Royal. Hope Hospital in Salford, the psychiatric unit. What was the first sign of a nervous breakdown? What is oh, that? Oh, just depression. Like the world is ending. Like the day after, or did it take a while to come on? Probably a week, two weeks. Yeah. And knowing that the, that's all I'd done since I was 17 was the band. Yeah. That was the only thing I'd done, and it wasn't there anymore. Uh -huh. It was like a death. Yeah. So, yeah, depression cre crept in. And what did that feel like? At the time, I just didn't want to speak to anyone. I just locked myself in the bedroom. And it was just like, I just couldn't handle it anymore. I just burst into tears one day and couldn't stop crying. And then my mum took me to the hospital, to the um, emergency room, and they, they put me in a um, psychiatric ward. Um, what? I remember, I think I'd been there like two weeks and all I could do, I was sat in a chair rocking backwards and forwards because of this drug called Stelazine that they gave me, a psychotropic thing, and it just made me rock in the chair. And I remember thinking, okay, this is me for the rest of my life. I'm just going to be sat in a chair rocking backwards and forwards. I had a breakdown and I ended up in Meadowbrook where Paul was. <laughs> We weren't there at the same time, no, that would have been brilliant though, wouldn't it, if we were? I was there before and he was there a couple of times afterwards. But it'd been funny if we were there at the same time, wouldn't it? That would have been brilliant. We had a good laugh in the, in the, in the nut house. We had a good, you know, we went to go and see him, we had a good laugh. Some of the stories were telling about people, but me, me, me and Paul struggled to uh, function just on a, on, a, on, a, on a normal basis for life. You know, he dealt with it with heroin, I dealt with it with alcohol or both had anxiety and both, we both struggled to function. I say we're very different but very similar. I can't do anything. I can't, really can't do anything. As time went on, I was there another four weeks and, and the antidepressants started to work and it was, uh, everything's on Ghidori again. Not within six weeks though, surely. More or less, yeah. Right. And what about the heroin at this point? Had you come I was off it, it yeah. Mm -hmm. Was, do you think that contributed to the depression? Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. Mm. I think one of the one of the issues with coming off heroin is, from what I learned from you, is that it's not just about giving up the heroin. It's about trying to work out why you did it in the first place and mm -hmm. fixing that. Yeah. Like fixing a drug addict isn't as simple as just taking the drug away. Mm -hmm. It's about looking at what made you do that in the first place. That's why I believe therapy is so important. Yeah. After you come off, um, after you've done a safe detox. Yeah. That's why. That's why I think it worked. The last time I went in rehab, is because I had therapy afterwards. Yeah, for a long time. And for seven years. Yeah. The therapy. What were the main things that came up in the therapy? Like what what were the, what did you learn about yourself? Um, that I could that little tiny things could could be exaggerated in my mind. I can't think of one specific one yeah. right now, but things that are trivial would would be magnified to the point of being crippled with fear. And you just learn how to deal with them. And that is when, I think that's when I met Donovan's daughter, Estrella, and we had a five-year relationship. So you had a nervous breakdown. Yeah. And then you, after the nervous breakdown, when you were feeling a bit better, you met, met Estrella. Met Estrella. Tell me about the day that you met Estrella, what that was like. Oh, I uh, somehow managed to get on the guest list for the Donovan show. Yeah. But the week before, I'd seen an interview in a Sunday magazine with a Sunday paper with Donovan and, and Estrella. I thought, oh, she's pretty nice. I'll, uh, and he's playing next week. I'll go and meet her. Right. And the next day, I uh, took her home to Hazelhurst Road in, in Worsley to my parents' house. What, the day after the show? Yeah. What, so you stayed with her that night? I stayed with her that night, yeah, yeah. in uh, the Midland Hotel. Yeah. And then went back to my mum's house and she said, Oh, you said you was going to meet her. I didn't think you was going to bring her home. Who uh, said that? Linda. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so 
yeah. So, was, um, and that was the next five years of my life with Estrella. And what was that relationship like? Oh, it was great at first. And Sean was in a relationship with her sister. Yeah, um, Oriel was still living in uh, in the desert, in Palm Desert, right. and she came over. She came over to England, and we introduced Sean to Oriel, and they had a they had a relationship as well. Oh, so you met met Estrella before he met Oriel? Then? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And how did that work? Two brothers going out with two sisters. It was kind of groovy. The two sisters got on well, did they? Oh, yeah. 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 Mm hmm So... And me and Sean was getting on well at that point. It's just that we both had heroin habits. Do you because... remember the first step, the first time you thought, oh, I'm just going to have a bit of heroin? Oh, yeah, it's always like, I'll just have it this once. But what triggered you, though, to do that? Um... You know, it doesn't have to be bad things that trigger you. Oh. It's good things as well. My life was on the up again. And it's like, oh yeah, I'll celebrate with a bit. Everything's going great. Wow, so I'll just yeah. destroy it. Yeah, it's a self-destruct button again. Did the sisters know that you both had heroin habits? Yeah. And how did they feel about that? Oh, they thought it was awful. I was trying to get me to stop. I was helping me to stop, helping me detox. Um, and eventually that's what ruined the, the relationship with both of us. Really? Yeah. As Paul was trying hard to resist sliding into full-blown addiction again, Gaz persuaded him to enrol with him on a music production course, where one day they met up with another friend of his, Dave Brattell, who Paul always called Disco Dave. I went to meet them to have some dinner, and, uh, and Paul said, oh, I can't wait for this afternoon. I said, why? And he goes, uh, oh, it's that one where we find out whether the bass can make you shit if it goes, like, dead low, <laughs> the sound of it. And this was, like, you know, his whole thing about uh, the course was trying to see if he can make his bass make people shit. <laughs> but they were, like, buzzing, saying, yeah, it's, it's true. You, it goes dead low, this bass, and it's so low, it gets in your belly, and you just shit everywhere. Oh, dear me. I don't know whether that is true. <laughs> they should sell it as a cure for constipation. <laughs> You can imagine it at a Monday's gig, you know, <laughs> for a laugh. You know, 5,000 people shitting everywhere. <laughs> Paul used to call me Disco Dave. The reason why I call me Disco Dave, uh, we're, we're, we're in Glasgow and, um, uh, and this uh, couple came across and said, uh, um, uh, oh, excuse me, can we have your autograph? And, uh, and, and Paul just smiled and I, and I said, yeah, yeah, of course you can. And so um, he, he, he said, OK. And he gave this um, uh, piece of paper, but he gave it to me. And, uh, and I said, what, what you? I said, do you mean it's Paul will sign it for you? And he went, no, no, it's for you. And I went, me? I said, uh, who do you think I am? And this like goes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, who the hell does he think I am? <laughs> and um, and uh, so, so they said, we've, we've come all the way from Aberdeen to see you. I thought, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> and... Um, uh, he said, yeah, yeah, we've, we've, bu we've booked in. We booked in last night and uh, 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 you're on tomorrow. Um, so, we, we, you know, we've got tickets and everything. He said, here's a flyer. And they, they'd, been, they'd come to some club night and the lead DJ was called Disco Dave. I don't... <laughs> it's and... because they'd said to you originally, you're Dave, aren't you? And you said, yeah, because you are. <laughs> so, so I signed it. They didn't want Paul's autograph. But my... So I signed, I signed it Disco Dave and that's, that's where it came from. <laughs> My mates and Paul's mates, like, have just been friends forever. And in fact, our kid used to work on the post with Paul. So we've always kind of, sort of, like, yeah. crossed each other. And then um, in the 90s, um, uh, we got to know each other pretty well and pretty much hung around for, you know, like, a um, um, couple of decades then and did various things. And uh, he, he, Linda and Derek lived not too far from where we were living. Um, so uh, we used to go around there and you know, take him for a drink on a Sunday. It sounds always, no matter what the aftershave, it was always a really nice, clean, fresh smell. I think I remember that. We'd been together for seven years before we got married. 
And uh, for one reason or another, neither one of us actually ever wanted a wedding. Wanted to be married, but never actually wanted a wedding. So we decided to effectively elope and not tell anyone that we were getting married. But what we wanted to do is find a way of actually memorialising it. So we asked Paul to, we needed two people to do, be witnesses, um, which was our friend Andy and his then partner Karen. Um, and then we asked Paul if he would do a video for of the whole day so that if people wanted to have a look at it, they could. Um, and uh, I know that Linda later told me how excited Paul was to actually be to having this job and took it very seriously, the job of a camera operator. Um, unfortunately, he managed to somehow record the very worst of us, didn't he? It really wasn't a good tape, a good tape that came out. and. There was far too much swearing and, and poor behaviour going on, so we couldn't actually ever show it to any of our relatives at all. There, there, there wasn't five minutes we could salvage we from it. Salvage, even the actual, even the actual ceremony itself was just punctuated by heckling. Yeah, give it from a fucking him, kiss by him and Andy all the way through. He filmed the whole day. He was there the whole day, and we had gone for a meal in Barca afterwards, and. Everything, was, but there was just nothing that could be used because there was just this monologue going on in the background of every F word and C word and everything, just awful. He was talking over it and he was heckling as well. There was just, oh, it was just awful. <laughs> and then uh, the, the wedding night was also spoilt by Paul constantly ringing up, asking us if we were doing it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and just laughing his head off and putting the phone down. <laughs>Hopefully she won't mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tell me about the end of the relationship with Estrella. Um, oh, it was quite messy, quite messy. It ended up with me going into my first rehab. Um, I was so messed up again. Me and Paul had suffered from anxiety and depression. With that's a few other thing we had in common. We both had depression and anxiety. Do you think that was caused by your experience being in the band, the highs and the lows? No, I think you got. that's why you end up being a musician. Well, it depends. Maybe everyone's different. Mine was caused by the accident I had when I was 11. I never kind of recovered from that. Everything goes back, back to that. I snapped my arm in half uh, and my bone and my elbow came through. Me. But the problem was it was just before I started high school. So I missed six months of high school. I was in Salford Royal for a few months. But the problem was I didn't know whether it would work again. So that, the, the, they saved me out. Before I went under, they said, we might have to amputate. So I remember that going under. And then the doctors came in the after and said, you're going to be in for a long time, but we managed to save the arm. But you might not be able to use it. It's a lot of nerve damage. And I was like, oh, well, I'll just have an arm, won't be able to use it. And I've been having guitar lessons for three years. And so I thought, oh, I won't be able to play guitar anymore. And then they came to me and said, you will get the nerves back bit by bit. It took six years for the nerves to come back in my fingers. But they said, but this is the head, this is what messed my head up. They said, but your arm might never grow. So I might have this 11 year old's arm for all my life. So I know, you, so every day, you're laughing. So every day I'd be like this, checking my arm's growth. So, so, that, so that started my OCD, my anxiety. So literally every day I'd be checking my arm. The lifestyle doesn't help. You know, when you've got depression, mental illness, you need, you need stability, you need, uh, routine you don't need a lot of drugs and alcohol you know and i and remember i've not seen a psychiatrist for years but it must be about 15 years ago and they, they, they said to me he said really what you need is something somewhere a job where you don't travel a lot you have a routine it's not noisy and you're not around a lot of people and i said well that that doesn't help he said what's your job i said i'm a rock drummer in a band and he just started he actually started laughing and he went can't help you. <laughs> so I think, you know, so, so I think there's, a, you know, there's, there's kind of that. So it, I think it doesn't help. I think it just trig makes it worse. I stopped going to meetings, which, which was another downfall. So 
at what point did you break up with Estrella? Oh, while I was in rehab. Oh, why? What happened? She just had enough. Yeah. Just she just had enough. Couldn't take any more of my using and drinking. Right, and how did that make you feel? Awful, rejection again. Yeah. Can't handle rejection. Yeah. I mean, I can now because I've had, like I say, I had seven years therapy. Yeah. You know, I've worked on rejection. But yeah, but at the time it was like, oh, this is awful. But you still managed to stay clean when you came out for a short period. For a time. short period, yeah. Then I thought I was well and I didn't need meetings, and uh, and that was the downfall. Okay. So then, what was the result of you picking up the drugs again? Um, just having to go and score every day, so I wouldn't be ill. You know, I needed it to to feel better, to function throughout the day. So. You're back at your parents' house. You were back on drugs. Your relationship with Estrella had that was uh, over. Had ended, and so then what happened? And then they had uh, Jacob and Amelia right. living with me at my parents' house. Right, and then you got another breakdown. Then another breakdown. And what was that like compared to the first one? Pretty much, pretty much the same. What just, happened? Uh, uh, just hopelessness. Yeah. Everything was hopeless. I was. I couldn't see. I couldn't see anything in the future. Didn't you grow a big beard as well? Oh yeah, my uh, Paul McCartney "Let It Be" era beard. Yeah. Oh, my mate Andy Hardy said I looked like James Anderson, <laughs> who was a, who was a police constable of Manchester, also known as God's Cop. Yeah, he said I look like James Anderson. I, so, I preferred the uh, Paul McCartney reference <laughs> myself. <laughs> <laughs> so how did that manifest itself then? What did it look like to everybody on the outside? I don't know. You'd have to interview them. Birds nesting in his beard. He had food all around yeah. it. Paul was back at home. You know, he was struggling with alcohol and he was coming off heroin, trying to come off heroin. And uh, he was in a right state at that time. He was in a right state. Um, initially, f he was drinking still. So me and Dave and Paul would go to pubs various in the area. We'd go around and pick him up and take him out because basically he was sat in his house all the time, um, not really doing anything, not functioning well. I think his mental health was suffering at that time as well. It wasn't in a good place, Paul. You know what I mean? He was he really was struggling. You know, we could say that. Again, it's it, he was still drinking at that time, even though he wasn't drinking particularly excessively. He was using alcohol every day. He'd start the day with his, you know, a couple of cans of Stella. He would be allocated four cans of Stella, which he would have, that would be it. That would be his his beer intake for the day. He struggled for a long time, Paul. He wasn't in a good shape. You know, he'd have, invariably have the same clothes on every day. He'd have a pair of tracky bottoms on, stained. He'd have a T-shirt stained. He'd have food in his beard, you know, weren't washing particularly well. He wasn't looking after himself. He was, he, was in a, he, was in a, he was in a state then, at that time. Were you rocking in the chair again? I was rocking in the chair again. I remember, remember the show Top of the Pops 2. Yeah. Where they 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 have uh, revisit all top mm. of the pops performances. I remember with the big beard, back in the living room at the parents' house, and top of the pops two was on, and one of the Mondays songs came on, and I was, I was looking at it thinking, what happened? That used to be me, mm. you know. Wow, how was Sean with you in these times? Oh, his answer was to give me a big chunk of. Lebanese hash, shove it down my throat and said, that'll help you. Did it? Oh, it sent me off my head for like two days. Yeah, yeah. but that was his answer. Was he concerned about you though? I don't think he was concerned. I think he might have been... That was his... That, that's how he, he chose to help, you know? Yeah. Not knowing much about drug addiction. That's his love language, I guess. Yeah. I suppose he thought he was helping you. Yeah. But did he have much contact with you when you were in such a bad way? Not really. I'd see him if he'd pop he'd pop in every now and then to see my mum and I'd see him but I, I I was just more concerned about growing a big beard. And you didn't speak to anyone at all? 
Not really, no. Didn't kids? You? Oh, the kids was there all the time, Did yeah. Did you speak to them, though? Yeah, I spoke to the kids. Yeah. But not, you know, I was pretty vacant. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, a good yeah. album. Good name for an album, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what got you out of that second nervous breakdown? Um... Hmm. Remember, Gaz used to come and see me once a day. He helped. You didn't go back into Meadowbrook then? No, I was in Trafford General for like three days hmm. in their psychiatric ward. Yeah. And then I just packed my bags and left and went back to my parents' house hmm. and just took the medication that was prescribed. You know, and after after a few weeks, I started to feel better. Right. But Gaz came to see me every day. Yeah. Yeah. Good friend. Yeah, good friend. So Paul was beginning to feel better and started the music production course with Gaz. And on the first day, he saw a familiar face. I'm uh, Himmett, the percussionist from MV, uh, Manchester Vibes in the area. And uh, I decided to take on a music production course. And while I was on this music production course, on the dinner break, somebody over the table says to me, are you Himmett from Envita? So I, I lifted my head up and looked, and it was Horse. Asking, I said, yeah, it's me. So, and I said, is that you, Paul? He said, it's me, Paul, and Gaz. I couldn't believe that they were there as well. And I thought to myself, what's going on here? So on the dinner break, we went for a pint, we, we had a, a roll up, and uh, that was it. We hit it off like three naughty kids all, t together. So I'm reading the paper, the local paper, on a dinner break, and uh, it said Salford Ram Raiders, and all the warehouses are getting done in. So I says to the horse, I says, horse, I says, we're going to write a track about Ram Raiders in Salford, all your boys, all your crew. <laughs> and he. He says to me, yeah, let's do it. So I've written, the, I penned some lyrics down, a few ideas, a skeleton of a structure. And then I said to him, I've got a, a producer friend of mine called Lee Duval. And uh, I'd like you to come outside of college to Lee's house, to his studio, where we can continue working and writing. So he says, yeah, let's do it. When um, Emmett brought... Paul to my house and I'll always call him Paul I never call him horse and the simple reason is my mum was here and he walks in now I've been doing dance music I didn't know who the happy Mondays were and it sounds mental but I used to listen to heavy metal and then got into dance music so I didn't know who the Mondays were and him it was like I'm bringing horse down from the Mondays and I'm thinking who's that do you know what I mean oh he's a bass player all right okay bring him down so he turns up, and then it goes, and my mum's there. And then it goes, uh, this is us. And my mum's from Salford, even though we're in Lynn. And she goes, I'm not bloody calling you horse. What's your bloody proper name? And he goes, Paul. And he goes, I'll call you bloody Paul. And Lee, you're calling him Paul too. <laughs> so I always call him Paul. He calls him horse. I call him Paul. And when you write music together, you get a bond no yeah. matter how, you know, you could yeah, be yeah, doing yeah, the yeah. track for half a day or something. Yeah. But if you've created something together and you liked it, you have a bond for life. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had with Paul. Later on, I would got ill, like with cancer and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, Paul was like a, um, a real shining light in a, a, a dark time for me. You know, like he gave me the opportunity to uh, remix flashbacks which a remix for him and him and Bez used to play it out when they were doing DJ gigs together. And because I was ill at the time, it just gave me a sense of purpose, you know, because w when you're ill and especially when you've got cancer, you find that all your true friends will stick by you and contact you and stuff like that. And I, I know who my true friends are and all the others will just run because they don't know, maybe they don't know how to handle it and stuff like that. But he was there. He invited me to his gigs, put me on the guest list for the Mondays. I mean, for me, um, any... Um, I'm get upset now. Paul was a good friend. So then, 
everything changed overnight, really, didn't it, in 1999. Paul got a phone call from uh, uh, Huey from the uh, Fun Loving Criminals who said that he was playing a gig in Par Hall in Warrington and would Paul go along to see him? So, uh, so Paul said, do you want to come and see the Fun Loving Criminals? So I said, yeah, OK. And when we were there, um, this bloke came up to Paul, I didn't know him from Adam, and said, uh, oh, hiya Paul, I've been wanting to have a word with you. I must have been feeling better when I was going out and I bumped into Simon Moran, who's uh, from SJM Concerts, probably the biggest concert promoter in Europe. And um, he said, how do you feel about getting the band back together and doing a tour? But that was how the approach happened. So what did you say when he said that? And what did you think? Where did your mind go with that? My mind went, well, went straight to, will anyone turn up and watch us? Uh, Andrew, Andrew <laughs> Rangers. It was Andrew Rangers. Yeah. On the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, and then it started being on the news and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem real. Because it was like... Because you'd, you'd always thought... You know, Paul's not the healthiest of blokes, you know what I mean? He don't, he don't, he don't go to the gym, you know. He, uh, he, uh, he you know, he, he smokes, you know, he's, he's the, you know, world champion smoker. And, uh, uh, and, and, you know, the amount of uh, uh, drugs he's consumed and alcohol he's drunk, you know. He, he, he was never going to be, uh, you know, get a telegram from the Queen or anything. But, but it still was, you know, painfully young. You know, you still, even though you, you think people are not that healthy. Uh, or you assume they're not, you know, you don't equate that with the, you know, with thinking they're going to die soon. Paul was always just part of our, our lives in and out, and sometimes you saw him, sometimes you didn't, and you'd get a message every so often, and, um, you know, just the odd, and, and, but it was always, I always smiled when I saw him, do you know what I mean, whenever I saw Paul, it was, oh, it's Paul, and it was always a nice to see him, and nice to catch up, you know, and, uh, it's just a shame that we're not going to be able to do that anymore. I don't know whether I had some kind of issue with light bulbs, but I, I, I invariably had been buying light bulbs when I, when I, when I saw him and, went and uh, he said, have you been doing light, light bulbs again? And he just happened, I just happened to be buying light bulbs. And, um, and then for years afterwards, he used to send me texts, you all right for light bulbs, just out of the blue. <laughs> The other one you always used to do is you get to send a set, do you want an egg with that? Yeah. Oh, so, because I told him the story of how when I first met my mo our mother-in-law and first went over to dinner, she made me the most random meal I've ever had in my life, which was cheese and tomato pizza, boiled potatoes and Brussels sprouts. And she just went, do you want an egg with that? <laughs> And we told him that, and for the next 25 years, every so often, there'd just be a text going, do you want an egg with that? <laughs> it really tickled him. <laughs> Coming up on the show next week... Taking a lead from Sean on the music never, ever, ever happened, and it never will. I pulled Sean to the side, and I was like, listen, we've got a problem here. Unless this wallet and money is put back within the next hour, we're walking and I'm never going to work with you guys again. You don't fucking do that. We went to Dublin. You were doing a gig in Dublin and I was with you. Right. And you told me that your friends, Andy and Dave, Disco Dave and yeah. Andy Hardy, wanted to talk to me. Oh. And I said, what do they want to talk to me about? And you said, we're going to tell you that I've started using again. Oh, my God. Did this really happen? The music you can hear is the fab track called Ram Raiders that Paul wrote with Lee and Himmett, who you saw earlier, and another guy called Phil Jones. Special thanks today go to Jeff Tidy, Steve Ness, Michael Smith, Simon Gilroy and Mark Duffy for joining our special club and becoming patrons of the show. It's really exciting to see it grow. Please join us at the special rate for founding members. We've really got some great perks planned. Details are on the website, which is paulrider.tv. And also go and have a look at our merch that we've got for sale in the shop. Thank
thank you so much for being here. Please spread the word about this project and let's have Paul's legacy go far and wide. Take care of yourselves and we'll be here again next week. Same time, same place. Thank you to our guests and of course, again, as usual, to the star of the show, the late, great Paul Anthony Ryder. <laughs> Don't make me the excuse, Sam. <laughs>